So we're going to be talking about tibial shaft fractures and i um, going to focus on some more of the complicated issues, not necessarily the really basic stuff. So hopefully you understand the basic stuff already. So by that, I guess what I'm getting into is really getting into the um, expanded indications, right? I mean, mid-diaphyseal fractures um, can be relatively straightforward. Uh, but, um, you know, certainly tibial nails have now been expanded uh, in their indication to include proximal and distal third fractures where uh, the bone essentially widens, right? So you don't uh, necessarily have the luxury of the uh, rod sort of getting the reduction for you as it goes in. So starting point, alignment, much more tricky and difficult. So it's all about the reduction, right? The nail is not going to reduce this for you. I mean, certainly if you get into an area even a little bit further down from here, um, down into this area, you'd be certainly considered an extreme nail, but you could do it, but it's going to take a lot of reduction maneuvering to get that. Um, certainly a distractor is just one way to do that, but we'll go over some, some other methods as well. So here's a fracture. You, you look at this. At, looks pretty diaphyseal. Um, it's kind of you know bordering that area where you would consider it to be like almost like a proximal third fracture, right? It's really not you know but metadiaphyseal up in this area. It's kind of diaphyseal, but it's it is a proximal third, right? It's right up there. And um, you know if you're not careful with your starting point, um, you know that is if you don't start high enough and you don't come right down the middle, uh, then this is prone to malreduction. And you, you'll, you'll need some adjunctive techniques and aids to uh, avoid that problem. So proximal fractures are technically more challenging, right? And, and the distal ones are, are challenging as well, but it's a little bit easier to sort of, uh, you know, use some uh, techniques and aids to get those ones reduced. The proximal ones are probably a bit harder. They're prone to valgus uh, and varus, but more often valgus, and definitely procravatum deformities, where you have either translation or sort of apex anterior angulation. So here's that same case treated. You can see that uh, they did have a starting point that was, you know, fairly anterior, and, um, you know, fortunately in this case, uh, did not end up causing too much of the translation. I think this is probably a slight, slightly like a butterfly fragment here, but you can see a blocking screw sitting here, uh, preventing that rod from falling into this area here. Okay, and uh, I'll go over this in uh, uh, one of the other slideshows coming up where we'll show some examples from the uh, textbook uh, where you can get into trouble. And, you know, here's, here's an example of that as well. So, um, blocking screw in the distal tibia being done here and certainly one of the ways you can remember it if you if you just can't conceptually um, understand it is the screws are placed on the concave side of the deformity. What that means is here's the deformity here, here's the concave side of the deformity and if you put the blocking screws in here it effect effectively narrows the bone, right? It sort of narrow, narrows the bone. You sort of have this um, uh, you sort of instead of having the uh, cortex out here, the cortex is now effectively shortened, right? Your cortical diameter is now gone from here to here. Right? So it's not it doesn't have a doesn't have the ability to drift out into this corner anymore. So you effectively narrow the canal. You know, if you we're having the trouble thing going each, you know, both directions. You could even, you know, put a blocking screw on either side and really just force that thing right down the middle. And when it goes down the middle, you're more likely to have a well-aligned fracture as opposed to this one here, which is angulating. So blocking screws or polar screws functionally narrow the intramedullary canal. Um, they increase. Um, uh, you know, they increase um, strength and rigidity of fixation um, by preventing that sort of toggle back and forth. Um, 
So you know, this is not a new technique. Uh, Christian Craddock reported on this back in uh, 1999, um, and uh, it's a technique that uh, you know is proven helpful. And hopefully you'll get to do some cases where you'll need to do this. So here's an example of a nice starting point for a proximal third tibia fracture. Now this is a you know pretty minimally displaced fracture uh, to be sure. Uh, but, you know, if you use the wrong technique, you can actually um, cause the fracture to become angulated if you're not careful. All right, so here's a good starting point, slightly lateral to the midline and very, very high on the tibia. So um, let's talk about treatment options in distal tibia. So in the distal tibia, um, you know, certainly closed treatment is an option minimally displaced fractures, and high-risk patients. Why? Well, because, you know, you have more soft tissue problems uh, in the distal tibia uh, than you can in the proximal tibia, more prone to infection and wound breakdown. So even in a really, really distal fracture, like this one here, IM nailing is an advantage, minimally invasive. You know, here you can kind of like, you can see plating of the fibula provides a little additional stability. There's a blocking screw here, and and there's only one AP screw and one medial to lateral screw holding this rod together. And you can see this is a fracture where uh, the bone's already um, you know, mostly healed. You have one little broken screw here, uh, perhaps a uh, slight loss of alignment there. But, um, you know, especially if you have an open distal tibia fracture like this, uh, this can avoid some wound problems. It can be, however, technically demanding. You know, you're, you're putting a nail in through, you know, the, the proximal tibia that can cause knee pain for a fracture that's all the way down here, and you still may end up having to plate the fibula. Uh, so there are some disadvantages. What about X-Fix? Well, um, it's minimally invasive. It can allow weight bearing. Uh, disadvantages are pin tract infections, right, non-union, and certainly a fixator like this is poorly tolerated. Okay, now this is sort of a a complex tibia looked as an intra involvement. There is a metadiaphyseal component here. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe for this patient, this, this allows this patient to get up and walk on it, and perhaps um, there were some wound issues, or perhaps this was, for whatever reason, the best, the, the best choice. What about internal fixation? Well, um, you know, we talked about rods. What about plate and screws? Well, Certainly um, allows you early range of motion, like any internal fixation, prevents fracture disease, you get a nice reduction. Uh, the disadvantages, I think, are certainly a little higher risk of deep infection, hardware irritation, because you have this big plate, uh, especially if it's on the medial side, like this one, and sometimes non-union, if, if you're not careful. And sometimes it's beyond your control, but you have to select the patients properly. So. This is a place where you can do minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis, right? And, um, you know, the advantages, and we're, we're really, I'm talking about mostly extra-articular distal tibia fractures. Now, there is an intra-articular fracture line here, but we're really talking about uh, mostly, you know, metaphyseal or A-type periarticular fractures. Um, uh, you can plate these. It allows early range of motion, less disruption of the fracture site, and the disadvantage is malunion. So here's a fracture which I think you should just nail, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's just diaphyseal. Um, it's really pretty much above an area where you would plate, and you probably have to get the plate way up here. So that, that, that's a case you can just nail. Okay, here's another case, oblique. It's distal, but diaphyseal fracture, right? You should nail that too. All right, so I think we'll stop there, and um, I'll pick up here in the next talk. Thanks.